brought us together this evening to worship and study the biblical lands mentioned in both Old and New Testaments. I have the honor of introducing our speakers. We've got three wonderful speakers, distinguished speakers. Uh, the first of them is Ben Witherington, a friend of mine, uh, professor of New Testament interpretation at Asbury Seminary. Ben Lee needs little introduction, the author of more than 30 books. Uh, ben has been quoted widely. Now, from what we can tell, the text of the New Testament books were treasured during the first century and were lovingly and carefully copied for centuries thereafter. There is even evidence, beginning in the second century, of the use of female Christian scribes. You want to know why? They had a better handwriting than the male scribes. <laughs> We have then three oral biographies in the New Testament, Matthew, Mark, and John. We have one historical monograph, Luke Acts. These documents as well as the letters were meant to be heard and not merely read. You were already begin to be taught how to form rhetorical exercises, how to create parables, how to ask rhetorical questions, in the earliest education you could get in antiquity. Learning how to write letters, well, that was part of tertiary education if you ever got that far. And even most of the educated did not get that far. distribution of Jewish inscriptions in Ionia, Phrygia, Caria, Lydia, Galatia, and Pisidia reaffirms further the probability of widespread Jewish literacy in Anatolia. It was challenging, so good reading required familiarity with the text. Who might this lector be, and what would be his relationship to the text and its author? Most probably he was someone known to John, the book of Acts records that Paul was allowed personal attendance while he was imprisoned in Caesarea and later in Rome. Some girls received a degree of education, probably in part at school and were able to compete in calligraphy. And so again, what Ben was saying is in the second century, those women began to function as scribes. We have some record of that even in the period uh, BC in Pergamum. So whether this attitude toward general education of, men and, of both boys and girls continued into the Roman period in Pergamum is unknown, but probable. I will trust you. For the church is seen in his epistles and his love for the gospel is seen as he lived out his life for Christ. Of Alexandria Troas. It lies about 250 maybe 300 miles up the Aegean coast from our location here in Ephesus. It's about 10 miles south of Homer's city of Troy and it actually has a couple of important links to the city of Ephesus where we find ourselves tonight. Both of these cities were harbor cities on the Aegean. He was also building an Excedra in Olympia, an Odeon at Athens, and quite a few other projects as well. And perhaps that's the reason why apparently he got in over his head up at Alexandria Troas and 
had to have his father bail him out financially to finish that project. Any good real estate broker is going to tell you that there's three keys to the value and the importance of a piece of land. Location, location, and location. So that should alert you to what I'm up to here today. The first two observations about the importance of the city in the ancient world are meant to contribute as arguments to a case that I want to make about the importance of Alexandria Troas and its location to us who are traveling today through this beautiful and this historic land of Anatolia. So the next time a busload of travelers sits inside the bus at Alexandria Troas or any other momentous location, you're likely to hear at least one trip leader <laughs> warn them against this variety of docetism that is ready to settle for abstractions on a map and descriptions in a book instead of the physical experience of standing where the saints of old have stood. Thank you very much.